my god, bro, it's actually time. <laughs> so, title is, I got kicked out of my <laughs> guaranteed spot in med school. Oh my god, that's insane. I had a guaranteed spot in medical school, and then I lost it. In this video, I'm going to be explaining how I got removed from my BSMD program, and subsequently, how I got accepted into nine different medical schools. My name is Numan Ahmad, also known as the Ibn Ahmed, and if you're watching this thinking that your medical journey is over because of some kind of major setback or something like that, this video is for you. So let me start off by explaining what exactly is a BSMD program. So a BSMD program is basically a six to eight year combined program with a Bachelor of Science degree and then a medical degree combined with it. So some schools have it where you graduate from college in two years, sometimes it's three years. The one I was in was in four years of undergrad and then four years of medical school. In my particular situation, I had to have a 3.5 semester GPA every semester. I needed to do some amount of shadowing every semester. I needed to have a 502 MCAT by the time I had to apply with at least 124 on each section. So coming out of high school, entering into a BSMD program, I thought I already made it. Like, that was my first mistake. Like, the relief from my parents to, like, that their beta was gonna become a doctor was, like, <laughs> the best thing in the world to them. And then I got comfortable. Like, I got too comfortable. So, entering college, bro, especially after, like, COVID hitting during senior year and really carrying through until freshman year, things were bad. Things went wrong. So I'm looking at my transcript over here. It looks like uh, my first semester, I had a 3.64 GPA. It's like uh, the first time I really ever got a B in my entire life. Uh, living independently, learning to live alone and not have any family pressure on you. It's like a, definitely a different thing. So for me, I kind of didn't care. I felt like I was in this program and like it, my grades kind of didn't matter. So the first semester, I actually did pass all the requirements, although I didn't do any shadowing. Anyway, then we hit the spring semester and that's where things actually got terrible. So I had a 2.8 GPA. This C in general chemistry, C in business computing systems. In uh, this BUSA class, I actually had a D originally, and then I had it converted to a C because I missed the final exam, and the whole class was actually online, but I just literally didn't go for the final exam, <laughs> which shows you like the utter lack of care that I had for my grades. People sometimes say C's get degrees, but that's definitely not the case when it comes to the program that I was in. So I could see here that I was below my GPA requirement. Yeah, so my mentality was kind of like, I'll just, I'll it next semester but that didn't end up happening before i knew it i was a sophomore summer had already passed and i was in my second year of college and i was like dude i gotta get my act together so i took some summer classes and then uh the subsequent fall semester got even more c's <laughs> epic fail there was a period where i was kind of like questioning can i really keep this up can i keep getting c's in all my classes and still try to go to med school and then i was like all right bro this is insane i, I can't keep doing this anymore so then uh it came time for organic chemistry and then organic chemistry it was notorious for being like one of those weed out courses where people who wanted to do medical school but you know didn't really apply themselves they would fail organic chemistry and ultimately have trouble landing into medical school because of that my hero because of that stigma with OCHEM, I basically tried really hard ever since then in college and can see the upward trajectory in my grades over here. So we have 2.8 to roughly a 3 and then to a 3.5 and then since then a 4.0 onward. So I put in a lot of effort when it came to OCHEM too. Lots of late nights studying, lots of all-nighters at the library, and ultimately I was able to bring myself up to a 4.0 GPA while I was enrolled in probably the hardest classes I've ever taken. After my junior year, I was like, okay, crap, now it's time to apply for med school. <laughs> like, I don't know where, bro. It's like, holy crap, I gotta apply for med school now. So I started studying for the MCAT, got a UWorld subscription, got the Anki Dex, um, and then just started grinding it out. As you guys saw on the live stream, I ended up with 502 on my exam, which is exactly what I needed on my requirements, except I didn't have a 124 on cars. After taking my MCAT and submitting my application for the medical school with little shadowing of poor GPA and not so ideal MCAT score, I was ultimately removed from my program. And to me, that was heartbreaking. The reality hit me. I was like, I was just another pre-med now. And I had to finish my bachelor's degree as a regular pre-med student with no guaranteed admission to medical school and with the 502 MCAT. There was one friend I even had who basically asked me, hey, are you still inside of that program? And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was at the time, but um, deep down, I knew that I wasn't because my GPA sucked. Like it was so bad. So I asked myself like, 
like, what's my plan? You know, like I have this 502 MCAT. What's, what do I do? Do I retake the MCAT? And there's a live stream that I made. It's literally called Imminent Life Decisions, where I was questioning on live stream and wondering, you know, what is the right thing to do? Do I rely on my computer science degree? Do I restudy for the MCAT? Or do I apply for other medical schools that may not be as great? So I had to answer that question for myself. And when I did a little bit more research, I found about osteopathic medicine. And I was able to see how these DO schools don't have as high of MCAT requirements. So it came out to be that my MCAT was actually sufficient for a lot of these schools. I wanted to shadow an osteopathic physician. The first DO that I shadowed was very interesting compared to the other physicians that I had shadowed where they were focused on getting patients in and out of the clinic as soon as possible. He took a lot of time and effort into each patient to understand them for who they are. So it's a more holistic perspective when it comes to patient care. So I made a list of 16 different schools that I wanted to apply for and ultimately I was able to send my application on January 21st. So a lot of you guys asked me when exactly you're supposed to submit secondary applications for osteopathic medical schools schools, you have to basically get invited for a secondary application. The whole process of medical school admissions is basically like a continuous filter. So the first step will be to submit your primaries. And from all those primary applications that are received by the school, the admissions committee will select a smaller number of secondary applications that they invite to the students to complete. I feel like secondary applications are really where the schools try to see your fit and mission alignment. They want to see you at a deeper level to understand like how you align with the institution's mission and stuff like that. So one of the things that definitely helped me when it came to writing these essays was taking the mission statement and the vision and the purpose of each school as found on their website and then basically trying to hybridize it into different templates that I had for the secondary essays and repurposing it into a final product by using AI. And so soon enough after submitting my secondary applications I was able to get interview invitations and I was surprised. I was like dang like I actually got interviews for medical school which is something that I never had prior to that. Someone asked me is there anything that I would do different for the application process. There was one week where I had so many secondary applications sent to me and what I would do is to just submit secondaries more proactively so just be more on top of it because the sooner you send in your, your materials the better off you'll be. But also I do believe my application could have been stronger if I just wrote my essays a little bit better. Just make sure that it doesn't compromise on the quality of your essays when you submit them because I had a typo in mind and I honestly think that was probably why they rejected me. Now someone else on stream asked me what was the best thing that I wrote about or applying for the osteopathic medical schools and I really think the truth of the matter is just shadowing a DO, particularly a DO who practices osteopathic manipulation. That was probably the biggest thing that helped me understand like what osteopathic medicine is and being able to have you know a connection with a DO physician who practices what it stands for. Now as far as interviews, a lot of people ask me some questions about that. What I will say is that any materials, they'll have a whole profile, a whole stack of information about you, all the documents that you sent to them and they'll be able to look through them and you know like, like ask you questions. Some interviews will be with one person, so it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Other times it will be breakout rooms. I did mine majoritarily over Zoom, so it'll be like you talk to one professor, then you talk to another one. I only went for one interview in person, but the point is don't lie on your application and don't inflate what happens on your application. Don't, you know, lie about the hours or anything that you do. Don't augment the reality of the situation. Try to act super emotional when you really don't care deep down, because people can tell that, you know? Like, the biggest thing I think I said on stream was to just be yourself. So don't script answers, but do have, like, some key point about what some of the common questions would be, being able to have some common responses. So things like why medicine, why osteopathic medicine, what is one volunteering experience that impacted you? And sometimes they'll ask you follow-up questions like uh, what did you see and why did it impact you? I think the biggest thing about interviews, the biggest thing is number one, authenticity. And number two, it's not so much what you say, but it's how you say it. So if you go in there confidently, you actually know what you're talking about and you're authentic. The way that you speak will come more authentically. It will come across to the person as so they actually feel what you're saying um, and stuff like that. Now we get into the biggest point that people have been wondering about, which is where did I apply? Where did I get accepted? <laughs> where did I get rejected? Where did I get interviewed? Where did I get waitlisted? So I applied to 16 different osteopathic medical schools. So as you can see here, this is my spreadsheet that basically shows the places I applied, their acceptance rates, whether I was invited to complete the secondary application, if I completed the secondary application, and if I was subsequently invited to interview. And then we can see the date of my interview. And lastly, we can see the verdict of each school where I ultimately 
ultimately got accepted, rejected, waitlisted, and ghosted. <laughs> and here we can see as well the date of when I got accepted, rejected, or waitlisted, and the date of which I paid, if I paid anything at all. And then the state, city, population, because, you know, being in a place that's not totally in the middle of nowhere is important to me. So we can also see below the criteria that I was looking for in a medical school. The biggest things I was looking for was I wanted to attend a medical school that met the following criteria. Number one, not exorbitantly expensive. Some of these schools are like $100,000 a year or more, which is ridiculous. Um, I also didn't want to be in the middle of nowhere because if you're paying that much money, like to be around nobody is ridiculous. Um, I wanted to, at the core essence of a medical school education is like the exposure you get to medicine and hence core rotations are also of great interest to me. So being able to rotate at level one trauma centers where I would be able to see basically the worst cases of patients and how doctors are able to treat those kinds of uh, situations um, for my education, I thought that was important. Additionally, being able to go to a school that historically has had good match rates and good matches and competitive specialties is something that I wanted to look for in a medical school. I said on stream that so many of you guys have asked me like, what, what specialty do you want to do? I don't know, bro. But at the same time, if I go to a school that doesn't have a good match list or doesn't have good rotations, you know, doesn't have a lot of resources, then the idea of me pursuing a competitive specialty is basically, it's not going to be a possibility. So additionally, like I said, having good research output and opportunities to partake in research, that's definitely something that helps with uh, matching into competitive specialties. And at the broadest level, I want to have a school that will genuinely train and prepare me to become a good physician. That's the biggest thing. Uh, considering that I got accepted into nine medical schools and, you know, LECOM was one of the schools that had one of the best match lists, um, is basically the nation's largest medical college, and I got accepted on the directed study pathway, and they have really good research opportunities and really good rotation sites at level one trauma centers, I figured, you know what, LECOM sounds like the best bet. So, literally on May 18th, I was given notification of my acceptance, as you can see on the letter on screen, and I ultimately paid the seat deposit, and I'm going to LECOM next year, or in a month. <laughs> which is insane, bro. So I also did some math over here. We calculate the success rates by each step. So for invitation to complete secondary application, I had a 16 out of 16, which is 100% success rate. And then submitting 15 out of 16 secondary applications gives me a 94% submission rate. And out of the 15 that I sent, 12 out of 16 invited me for interviews. So that's a 75% interview rate. And then ultimately after the interviews, nine out of the 16 schools accepted me, which means I had a 56% acceptance rate which is absolutely insane. So I did some math. It looks like for the schools where I found the acceptance rates for each of those schools, if I multiply the percentages together, I get a one in 45 million chance of me actually getting that, which is insane. I'm cool, bro. Like I'm cool. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's all because of Allah, bro. It's all because of Allah. I could not have done it without Allah. You guys have been an instrumental part of the journey, helping me feel motivated for the MCAT, helping me, helping me feel motivated to continue through my last semester of college and inshallah, motivating me to continue throughout this journey on medicine and throughout this journey on YouTube. So here are some of the final lessons that I was able to extract some real talk, keeping it 100 with you guys, bro, keeping it a bean. Here are some lessons that I learned from this whole thing, the whole experience. Number one is that failure is not final. Failure is not final, bro. I didn't do that great on my MCAT, bro. There's some people who take a whole year off to study for the MCAT just so they can get accepted to one school. One test score does not define you. I've said this so many times on stream. One test score does not define you. This is true in medical school. This is true on the MCAT. This is true in college. This is true on your SATs. It doesn't matter what the test is so long as it's not this life because only Allah can test us. <laughs> um, lesson number two is that comfort is dangerous, bro. Like you can get comfortable, but don't get too comfortable. It's tempting to get more comfortable. It's like when you have an alarm clock and then you press snooze and then you're late and then you feel tempted to press snooze again or even turn off the alarm clock. If you do that, bro, like you're screwed. It's dangerous and you have to suffer the consequences of that when you wake up and you're not tired anymore because you'll get that rest, bro. You will you will sleep if you turn off your alarm clock. But when you wake up and you feel the guilt of not having completed what you needed to complete and you go back to like, you realize that you have these priorities in life and then you don't meet up to them, you don't live up to them, then it's like, it's dangerous not only in terms of the practical applications but also for your soul. Like your soul will feel the danger, the, the, the bad consequences of, of that comfort, of succumbing to that comfort and, and uh, not making the compromise to do the right thing. Lesson number three is that a DO is not less than an MD. A DO is not less than an MD. So many people say on Reddit that a DO is less than an MD. That is not the case, bro. The only reason the match rates are lower for DOs is because osteopathic medical schools often have a focus on primary care, but that doesn't mean that any osteopathic physician can't match into a competitive specialty. And in fact, it has happened. The fact that DO 
DO students have matched in competitive specialties, to me, is a manifestation that a DO is not less than an MD. In fact, I believe a DO is more than an MD. You learn an extra skill that MDs do not, and you have the opportunity to work harder, to learn how to network with people, to have a more multifaceted approach toward medicine, to learn what the spirit is. These are all important things that, personally, I resonate with. I have my own opinions, but um, this leads me into the next lesson, which is that your path is unique. Your path is unique. You're not going to follow some guy's framework and expect to have the same exact results. You're two different people, bro. Like, you gotta, you gotta live up to you. So don't expect anything to be, like, the same way that happens to you than it does for someone else. Just because I got accepted into nine medical schools after getting a 502 doesn't mean you will as well. So you might get more, you might get less. It's up to God what happens. Ultimately, on this journey, I've learned so much. I've learned about my own self. I've learned about my motivations. I've learned about what really matters in life. I learned about different principles and values and characteristics and traits that make a person successful. And those are definitely lessons that I will take with my myself as I continue to go to medical school in the coming month. If you guys have any questions, feel free to comment in the comment section down below. I'll answer what I can. Subscribe if this helped you. And remember, every doctor has a story. This was mine.